this little documentary is all about rivers. It's about all the bits that make up a river. It's about the ways we humans change them. But mostly, it's about water bugs, because they're kind of cool. And it's my docker, so I get to choose. My name is John Goodrum, and I'm a freshwater ecologist with the National Water Bug Blitz. Water bugs include a lot of animals you are probably already familiar with. Dragonflies, worms, shrimp are all water bugs, as are mayflies, stoneflies and caddisflies. Water bugs can tell us a lot about the rivers they live in, simply by being there or by not being there. Nice, healthy rivers tend to have lots of different sorts of water bugs in them, while rivers like this one tend to have fewer different types of animals in them. This is Hobart Rivulet, just before it runs underneath Hobart Town. It has been constrained with concrete channels because it has a tendency to pop out of its channel during floods and eat roads and buildings and generally run amok. Throughout this documentary, we'll look at some rivers and the animals that occur in them. And the main thing I'm keen to illustrate is how incredibly important the different habitats are for these animals. We'll start by looking at this river, a river which has very few habitats. The water bugs that live here need to be able to tolerate lots of different horrible things. Strong, flashy flows and all manner of pollutants from poo washed in from nearby streets to car oil, herbicides, pesticides and even random pharmaceuticals. On top of this, there are precious few places to live. But even here, some tenacious critters persist. These are simulids, or black fly larva. These larva have no common name, despite being super distinctive and occurring all over the world. My friend Tom, also a freshwater ecologist, calls them chicken drumstick animals because of their shape. Their movement is leech-like, but rather than relying on suction cups, simulids are actually more like rock climbers. An organ under their mouth parts secretes a thin strand of silk that sticks to the rock surface, then an arc of little hooks on their posterior hooks into it, a bit like Velcro I guess. To move, the larva spits a new silk fastener, then appears to hold on with its mouth parts while manoeuvring its back end onto the new silk. Simulids are filter feeders, but before they set up to feed, they need to find just the right spot. And to do this, they need to clear away any competition from other larvae. People tend to complain when wind speeds get above about 35 or 40 kilometers an hour. On the rock surface in the middle of a river that's fast flowing like this one, the speed of the fluid moving past can reach an equivalent of around about 40 kilometers an hour. The thing about water is that it is much more viscous, however, and so it's much, much, much more likely to sweep you off the rocks and cast you downstream. Once they're in the right spot, the simulids unfurl their secret weapon. Part moose antler, part Japanese fan, these modified antennae are used to strain food particles from the passing water as it rushes over them. Adult simulids are active blood suckers and lack the charm of their larvae. While urban rivers only offer habitat for few organisms, Rocky riffles in rivers are the equivalent of high-density living for water bugs. The slow flow areas, the eddies, the super fast bits, the nooks, the crannies, each one provides a slightly different place for a different type of water bug to live. Add to that a tasty fuzz of algae, bacteria and fungi, and you have a paradise for small, oddly shaped animals. Until they get eaten by one of the many predators that also cause this home. A cased caddis grazes gunge from the surface of a rock. Water pennies eat the same stuff, 
their bodies are hardened to resist predators, and their body shape protects them in faster flows. Water mites can also be found in rivers. These brightly coloured, ungainly animals are unlikely predators of much smaller animals that live between the rocks. Baby dragonflies are more obvious predators. Even this young example moves like a predatory cat. Its eyes are exceptionally good and it is armed with a sling jaw that can grab its prey from half a body length away. In contrast, many of the stoneflies are simple vegetarians and spend their time grazing and avoiding dragonflies. This one's a group of rigid easily identified by the pom-pom of gills at the end of its abdomen. The structure is earned in the common name of fluffy bums. All stoneflies have two tails. Mayflies, like this baited, have three. This baited has found a spot on top of a rock where it can graze. Stoneflies and mayflies, along with caddisflies, are considered indicators of good river health. Much of the diversity between the rocks in this particular river is contributed by different types of insects. And while many of these may spend the majority of their life underwater, they will eventually leave water to reproduce. This process is called emergence. Emergence isn't necessarily pretty or painless. This particular sequence has been sped up 10 times. and it still takes quite a long time. Once their wings have dried, many insects like this caddis will head off into the vegetation alongside the river to find a mate. The vegetation alongside rivers provides yet another important habitat for water bugs. The riparian zone, as it is called, provides habitat and food resources for some of the emerging insects. But it also provides habitat for animals that can't leave the river by dropping sticks, leaves, and even larger bits of wood back into the water where they become habitat for a range of water bugs. Larger wood can accumulate around rocks forming debris dams, and these create all sorts of different places for water bugs to live. At a smaller scale, the leaves that fall in and accumulate provide both places to live in the gaps between the sticks and leaves, but they also provide food as the fungi and bacteria that decompose them are an important food resource for many water bugs. The upstream sections of Hobart Rivulet are some of the nicest bits of river you will ever find within walking distance of a central business district. It has all of the habitats we've discussed and heaps of leaf litter which supports a booming population of these little chaps, all busily shredding leaves into smaller and smaller bits that will eventually feed the simulids that we looked at downstream. Amphipods are sometimes called side swimmers, because they do. Water bugs are only part of the river ecosystem. They tend to fit in the middle of a great big sprawling food web. Most of them exist above algae and bacteria, but below things like fish. With a few notable exceptions. Other vertebrates, such as this platypus, also rely on water bugs as a source of food. This platypus from Hobart Rivulet probably eats upwards of hundreds of little side swimmers every morning for breakfast. As human beings, we use quite a lot of the landscape. It is inevitable that in some ways we will overlap with our rivers, and when we do, we modify them. Sometimes this involves removing aquatic habitats and riparian zones. Sometimes we manage to maintain bits and pieces of them. Often a balance can be struck, but we need to make these decisions from an informed position because river rehabilitation is much harder than simply not damaging them in the first place. The last part of this documentary dives back into the stream to look at two special Tasmanian freshwater macroinvertebrates, 
or water bugs. Tasmania's alpine and subalpine areas can be cold, wet, almost miserable, but they're also quite regularly very, very spectacular and definitely worth going to have a look at. It is in this alpine area that we find the first of the special Tasmanian water bugs that I want to introduce you to. Anaspides are also known as mountain shrimp because this is where they hang out. These little chaps are shredders, a bit like the amphipods that we saw further down the stream. And they eke out an existence, tearing up little bits of leaf litter into smaller and smaller pieces. Anaspides are opportunistic though, and they will also eat one another. Fossils of these little chaps from 220 million years ago show that their body plan hasn't really changed all that much. Another Tasmanian crustacean, the giant freshwater crayfish. These chaps grow up to about a metre long and live in excess of 30 years. But the giant freshwater crayfish isn't the last of the water bugs in this documentary. The last of the water bugs in this documentary is the little parasite thing on its claw. Have a closer look. Calling them parasites is probably a bit harsh as they don't actually hurt their host. These timnocephalids look a little bit like a cross between a sea anemone and a leech. Crayfish can be messy eaters, but their food doesn't go to waste, and every little particle of food that's chewed up and floats around the crayfish in a cloud gets taken up by one of these many temnocephalids. A lot goes into building a river. They are more than just lumps of rock, water and wood. They support a rich diversity of little things. If you are involved in rehabilitating some of our less loved waterways, then I hope this has given you a feel for why what you're doing is worthwhile. Replanting riparian zones, re-snagging, or even just putting up fences so that livestock are kept out. All of this helps provide and maintain habitat for water bugs. Oh, and fish and platypus and other things as well, but mainly water bugs.